All righty. Well, thank you, uh, Frederick, for taking the time to be on the podcast today. Today, we're going to talk about your book that's just recently been released, um, Raising Cyber Ethical Kids, um, Acceptable Policies, Looking at Devices, and all the things that you've been up to. Um, just before we kick off, if you'd like to give a quick introduction to yourself, tell us a bit more about you and some of the other books that you've written. Oh, that's great, Neil. Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. It's a real pleasure to be here. A little bit of background. Um, I'm an attorney by training, uh, practiced for about five years in the state of Vermont, then started working in computer consulting and uh, began looking at the possibility of doing some writing. My first book was published in 2000 called Obscene Profits, The Entrepreneurs of Pornography in the Cyber Age. And it was really the first book that looked at the social and economic implications of how the adult industry was going online. Um, and as you may be aware, a lot of the technology that is used on the internet today arose out of that industry. So I was trying to understand what the internet already was doing to us. Um, over the course of the next few years, I wrote books on workplace surveillance, on American privacy, the origins of the right to privacy, the religious battles in the United States and so on. In 2011, 2010, I got the idea for a book that was designed to help parents understand the risks that kids were facing online. And more importantly, the trouble that kids could get into from using these devices. And I called that Cyber Traps for the Young. And that came out in 2011. About six months after that book came out, <clears throat> a friend of mine um, or someone who became a very good friend of mine contacted me and he was very involved in the teacher licensing community. And I had already been thinking along those lines, but I picked up the pace on it and wrote a book called Cyber Traps for Educators, which is organized around the various types of trouble that teachers can get into. Everything from workplace harassment and bullying among peers to um, you know, voyeurism in the schools, to inappropriate messages with kids, and, and unfortunately leading all the way up to sexual assault. And, and the goal was to help the school community understand how that happened and what they could do to slow it down. So um, I've continued in the cyber traps vein, as you've seen, I did right. one for expecting moms and dads. And when I got locked down actually in York, UK, because we were over there for a year, um, all of a sudden I was able to concentrate a little bit better and get a couple of things done. So one of the things I got done is the book we're talking about today, Raising Cyber Ethical Kids. And then I finished an update for Cyber Traps for Educators, uh, which is now much longer, much more detailed and much more current, um, called version 2.0. So uh, that's, that's a very quick run through of the last 20 years. Thank you. No, thank you for doing that. And it's great to have you on. I, as I, we, we joked just before we started recording, I had you down as eight books, but actually it's 10. Um, yeah, so, ten. So is it now an, a very accomplished author? And uh, I, as you say, I've got a copy of the book here. It's uh, yeah. a you, you can see from the thickness. It, it's I'm not a huge reader. Um, it's super. I think for anyone raising children um, in the digital age, there's so many different challenges, and this book takes you um, from very young all the way through to the different cycles of their lives, mm -hmm. bringing some really good points about. Um, user policies, sort of not ignoring it, it, it nearly like setting the, the landscape when you I don't want to ruin the book. But when you look <laughs> at the, the fair access, uh, accessible use policies, not not, you know, not saying no, it's more like saying, this is part of the world now. And yes, we should all accept that. And we should all accept that children will and do and should have access to it but in a controlled way, it's not all good and right. bad. And there's different I, it, when it goes into it, the different ages. Yeah, if I may, Neil, I think that's really the core point of this book, right? Is that um, our children, and actually I've got, some, I've got some credibility here in the sense that uh, I, I'm the dad of two and stepdad of two other boys. Um, so we've gone through this a little while ago, to be fair, because our oldest were born in 93. But you know, particularly with the younger two kids, we watched them grow up as the World Wide Web was emerging. 
And then of course, cell phones coming in in late middle school, early high school, and mm. trying to figure out what was appropriate and, and what was not. But, you know, the, the, the fundamental reality is that, you know, the iPhone was introduced in 2007, right? So that's 13 years ago. We're rapidly approaching the point where there aren't going to be any adults who were not born after the iPhone was introduced. Indeed. That's only five years away. Mm. And that really helps to frame how much our society has changed mm. in terms of access to these devices. Now, one of the things I talk about is that parents face a lot of pressure from kids, right, mm. to get access to these devices as soon as possible. And although I don't think that parents should reflexively say no about everything, I think there's some real value to having conversations with children about what is the appropriate time to get access to some of these devices. Just by way of example, I can think of almost no good reason that a six-year-old needs to carry a smartphone into school. I mean, there's so many reasons why that doesn't make sense in terms mm -hmm. of distraction, the sheer cost of losing the device, potential damage. But then more importantly, the idea that you're giving an inexperienced child access to a global publishing platform yeah with all that implies yeah so, you know so these are the and, kinds and, of and global publishing and global in interaction yes like they, like there's no certainly as you say when we've gone from the worldwide web being very um dial up very <laughs> much home-based um right. it's now as you say it's in the palm of your hands it's app a lot of its app on the phones it is app generated which is, I means you can instantly download and have access to millions on millions of yes. people. And at an, an age that can bring about um, an uncontrolled environment that you as a parent now, it's the equivalent, I think, of, of taking your child and leaving him in the middle of a, a supermarket or a very, a very busy town center and walking away and just leaving them and, and knowing or feeling comfortable that you have total control on who speaks mm -hmm. to them and whether those people are who they say they are and whether their intent is really good. And, um, and I think that was something that I really took from the book about the, the ability to draw up guidelines of knowing when to present them with access, knowing when to take the phone away, no, not take the phone away, turn it off, put it to bed. I like that. <laughs> and that because I, I, I do think as well, children being children, as I would, and I'm sure you would, that when you're at a young age, if parents say no, you're going to find a way. And I of think, and I, and, and I think with the cell phone or with technology, it's quite probable because as you mentioned about the age of this, the smartphone, but we're, we, 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 we're probably only third generation raising children in a truly interconnected world in a digital age. And it's right. quite often that sometimes that the, the child or the um, young adult knows more than the adult. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly but, easy to, to manipulate that position without open right. guidelines. And, and in my experience, Neil, there's a couple of points that come out of that. I mean, parents, I think, are often intimidated by technology. Sure. And they're intimidated by their children's ability to use that technology. And when I talk to parent groups here in the U.S., uh, one of the things that I encourage them to remember is that the kids may have technical savvy, but the adults have experience and they have wisdom and they understand the implications and the consequences of their actions, which is not something that most kids have a really good grasp of no, just yet. Quite the opposite. So, so that, that will, that will is, always, that will always come with age yes. and lifelong. That that's the wise hat is very difficult for technology to, yeah, I love that. That's very that's yeah. Really well, and common. and the great thing is that you know I think that you want kids to learn through experience, right? Because experiential learning is often the most powerful and sticks the longest. But as with driving or learning how to use guns or learning how to use knives in the kitchen, there are potentially permanent consequences that can result from the misuse of these things we teach kids to use. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, parents have been very slow at putting a smartphone in the same category as a gun or a knife or a car. 
even though exactly the same level of harm can result from misusing these devices in a variety of different ways. Sure. And, you know, it, part of the problem, of course, as you know, working in technology and security and so forth, is that the programmers and the device developers do everything they can to make their products look as innocuous as possible and as easy to use. As a matter of fact, I mean, one of the specific goals when the iPhone was developed in 2006, 2007, was to develop an operating system that Jobs thought his main market would feel comfortable using. And his main market at that point was going to be business people with enough money floating around to actually buy this thing, because mm. it was quite expensive. What they didn't really think through was that they were developing an operating system that a three-year-old could use just as easily. And that's where I, we've gotten to where we are right now is that it takes no great cognitive ability to press a button mm. and to see what happens on the phone. Mm. So it, it exploded the potential use of these devices, which is great from a manufacturing perspective, but less good from a parenting and social perspective. That's very interesting. and. Um... I was I was thinking I wanted to touch on some of the parts that you bring up in 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 the book, particularly um, and there's a there's a recurring theme about the, the I don't want to obviously people should go out and buy it and we'll talk about where they can get it later of course I don't want to ruin the exploits but I think in a nutshell one of the things that I certainly took away and it's something that I've actually spoken to certain family members about is the the recurring discussion around the the fair uh, or the FAUP as you refer to it. Mm -hmm. um can you in a nutshell just for just for the listeners i don't obviously they, they will get it if they get the book but can you just summarize in a nutshell what that is and go a little bit further on what it means if you just articulate around that would be really great that sounds great that's easy to do so the book is organized around the concept of a family acceptable use policy and anybody who has worked in a contemporary business or has gone to a hotel or has gone to a coffee shop, has agreed to an acceptable use policy that governs what can and can't be done online. So what I am proposing to families is that they extend that concept to the family use of devices and online services. And I've had some fun back and forth with people, you know, as a non-practicing attorney. I'm not out here drumming up business right. for my colleagues. Right. This, is, this is not something that you need to go down to your local office and have drafted and get notarized and all of that. This is just an Conceptual, informal right? Framework. Right. It's, right. It's an informal framework. Some families may find it useful, particularly with like elementary school kids are really into signing their name. So you could have some fun with that. But the real purpose of these different policies that I suggest um, is to spark conversation. Because I will, I will argue strenuously, this is the hill I will die on, that lots and lots of conversation is the best prophylactic for protecting children online. I'd echo that. And, and, and the more conversation you have and the more open parents are about their own use of devices and technology, the easier it will be to keep everybody within a family's shared values for using the internet. And one other point that I like to throw out in, in this context is that part of my motivation for writing this is really as a um, supporter of free speech in the sense that I don't think that the government should be restricting what is available online. But it's absolutely appropriate within the family context for parents and children to decide what is and is not acceptable. And that's a much, I think, better approach. And it's more consistent with the concept of free speech in society uh, than requiring or asking the government to step in and, and quote unquote, clean up the Internet, because um, you can't do one size fits all when it comes to speech. No, and I think, and I think that the, the the family policy. What I what I learned from the book as well is that one size doesn't fit all, and it moves with the the age of the yeah. child. It moves yes. with the because a toddler to a, to a young adult 
the different facets that they go through in school, the different social groups they have, the different use they requirement for. A toddler doesn't need a smartphone for anything else. It, 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 I really thought that it was, the, I really felt that the, the book was something that you could pick up, put on a shelf, and as your child transitions, it, it would help you, <laughs> help you, you know, sort of, it, it's not yeah. a book that you pick up and put down. And I think it's also a book that you, you might pick up and turn, after you've read the sort of intro, you, you may move to to the appropriate chapter that, that best fits your child um, to get some advice. So it, I found it very quick in a way, very useful, yes. very informative, very right. simple. It's not a not a heavy not a heavy read at all. And it kind of got me thinking, as as um, Frederick, as you're coming on to the, the podcast today, that we spend a lot of time with our personal line cyber products um, aimed at family well being, cyber resilience, improving. Uh, home homeowners covered umbrellaed by insurance but with a lot of services that that are aimed at keeping them safe and I was thinking that from your standpoint if people don't start to address this matter better and we you've touched on it already but what sort of problems would you envision they're going to see over time like like in your experience what what have you seen if we continue on the landscape that we're on without taking as you say better control of this element of our children's um, exposure where do you see it going well i think we're already seeing it in a lot of ways neil in terms of the impact that digital communication has had on society broadly as we were chatting about before we got started uh, my current book project is the rise of the digital mob which is designed at looking at that precise question which is to say, if we give people um, unfettered access to the internet without guidelines for behavior or without moral values or without concepts of citizenship, then we're going to start seeing a chaotic, anarchic environment mm. in which it's extraordinarily difficult to have a civil society. And I think that that's one of the overarching philosophical concerns that we need to deal with. That's probably too theoretical for you know your average parent on a day-to-day -day basis. And so if you want to drill down to that level, I think one of the reasons I would encourage parents to read this book and to have these conversations with children is that there are demonstrable issues that arise for kids over a period of years if there isn't tempered access to online devices, you know, digital devices. Um, you know, physiologically, you've got issues in terms of sleep deprivation. You've got issues in terms of weight gain, uh, insufficient exercise, uh, distraction. Uh, we can get into a whole conversation. There's a, obviously a huge debate about the impact of video games mm -hmm. and what that does to the focus of children and their ability to interact with others. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. And I think that Part of my philosophical approach here is the belief that one of the goals of parenting is to prepare children for the world, but also to help make them functioning members of society. And one of the reasons I was focusing on the cyber ethics is that we now need to recognize that kids are not just operating in the 3D world, but they're also operating online. So they need to not only be good real life citizens, but digital citizens right. as well. And, and these are the kinds of conversations we need to have. Now, that being said, one of my closing lines for my lectures is always, it's not about the device, it's about the behavior. So if as parents, we're teaching children to be kind and empathetic and honest and fair in life, then hopefully those behaviors will extend online. It's, you know, you, there's not one concept of kindness online and one offline, but there's an intensity and a speed with which these online services, you know, grab our kids. Mm. And that does change things a little bit. So, you know, that there are some aspects of this that we really need to help our kids come to grip with, grips with in new ways. I think that, 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 thank you for that. It's a very, very strong answer i think also what we've experienced when we look more into this topic 
either in events that we're managing or circumstances that have occurred it's very if you're not engaged with your children on this level or, or open and talking about it what we've seen is you might think everything's okay <laughs> you might think that that that, that we've um, sadly here in the uk there's a there's a large rate of teen teenage suicide as i think there is globally and yes. it's and it and there's a lot of telltale signs sadly that are all too late when you look at or speak or, or 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 see what they've been looking at see some of the groups that they're involved in some of the events that are happening online some of the uh, possible cyber bullying that they're receiving that parents were just non aware of i think so i think that's another thing that scares me or, or or wants me to raise awareness with you and with with the work that we're doing on on side man and the other publications you're writing uh, and you're definitely going to come back i can tell through the other topics <laughs> that you're writing that we're we're excited for the next one because it's uh, it's just it, it is very easy for the for anybody if you're not having conversations about what they're up to online what they're looking at what they're doing to presume that everything's okay it's so easy to hide it away i think and that's something yeah. that we we know from a parenting standpoint is another reason why they 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 need to start having these these um use policies but also like you say the conversation mm -hmm. let's talk about yeah. it let's see what we're up to you know what are you doing how are you doing it and who are you doing right. it right well neil there's there's a couple of ways we can we can talk about this um for starters you know, when I was a kid, um, I don't I don't know about your personal background, but I grew up in a fairly small town, and you know, my mother was relatively cautious. You know, until I was in high school, she really made a point of knowing who I was playing with. Mm -hmm. You know, she would know the parents. She'd ask me where I was going. Yeah, same. Kind of <laughs> I, 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 I had to check back in every hour till I was about twelve, I think, or maybe even right. later. Um, yeah, 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 and it was you know probably. You know, the, the, one of the bigger offenses was to head off to a friend's house after school and not right. tell my mother where I was going, that kind of thing. And, you know, not, not everybody's going to have that experience, but the reality is, is that if kids have unfettered, unsupervised use of these smart devices, they're playing in a global village. I mean, yeah. we use that term a lot, but yeah. they really are. And it becomes much, much, much harder, I think, for parents to be aware of who is influencing exactly. their children. Yeah. And we see this in terms of body dysmorphia and body shaming. We see it in terms of, of food consumption, anorexia, bulimia. There's radicalization. I know there have been cases in the UK. There's yeah, been some huge. in the United States as well. Um, and, you know, even if it's not radicalization, you know, there's there's some real concern about, you know, exposure to other content that may be influential in ways we don't understand. So, you know, again, this is where the conversation comes in because if you're, if you've developed a habit or a pattern of talking to your children over a period of time about how they're using their devices, then you've got a baseline to recognize, as you say, when something changes. Exactly. All of a sudden now, your child is more secretive, is not eating dinner, um, wants to wear clothes, um, is trying to buy tickets to Syria, you know, little signs like that that help really kind of trigger, you know, some concern. And so that's part of the baseline there. The other thing too that, that I often encourage parents to try to do is to make their children into educators. And, and this can be really, really powerful, even at a young age, to ask a child, um, I've heard about this app. Can you help me download it and set up an account? What does it do? How do you use this app? Why, why do you like it? That kind of thing. Mm. And, and with that pattern of behavior over a number of years, you develop a bond in terms of the use of mobile services and so forth. It's not to say that problems won't still arise, because as you correctly point out, there's a rebellious phase that kicks in all the time. Of course. And that, that's not going to go away. But again, the more you have this level of communication about these potentially dangerous devices, the, the easier it is to get through that rebellion and, and help I, and the I, child. And I think yeah. you make a good point that we're not in any way 
like you say, the, the rebellion has uh, it dates far way back before technology, <laughs> and and is is um, actually if you, if your child isn't rebellious, then that would probably be more of a trigger that there there might be an issue. In fact, it's right. completely normal. But being rebellious um, is very different to being doing something in an unsafe environment that they're yes. not necessarily aware of. We see it a lot with sexting, where people are. are presuming yeah. that the person at the other end of that cam that they've connected with on an app is actually who they say they are and they're not recording or they're using Snapchat and they think the images aren't sticking around, but actually they are. And then there's it, that, that for me is the, the worst of the worst. I think being rebellious and um, when you're educated about the environment you're being rebellious in is very different. I think to being manipulated or becoming a victim mm -hmm. because you weren't in, in, informed by your parents in some way about Neil, if I could elements. jump in on this because I, I I do think we're touching on some really important issues here and I will say to parents that um, based on the research that I've done and in talking to parent groups uh, various times the most dangerous period of time for a child with a device is between 10 p.m and 3 a.m it you know the decision making process, is terrible. The, the idea of communicating directly from the child's bedroom to someone else right. is, is implicitly boundary breaking. And, you know, then you get into the sleep deprivation issue. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, there's a lot of concern that we have a generation of zombies coming up <laughs> because they're, you know, not getting enough sleep. And, uh, you know, this unfortunately is directly relevant to the book that is just coming out, Cyber Traps for Educators 2.0, because that's when a lot of these violations of the relationship between parent, uh, between teacher and student occur, is in the wee hours of the morning. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. what we've overlooked is that every child who has a cell phone or a smartphone can be reached directly without parental awareness. And again, going back to my childhood, and, and there are a lot of things I love about today as opposed to then, course, but I will say that when a teacher called my house, they would never speak to me directly. Mm. Either my parents would pick up the phone or they'd want to know who called and why. And nobody, of course, called after 9 p.m. That just wasn't done. That was you know, sort of the informal rule. Now, if a teacher knows a child's either phone number or user ID on some service, you know, whether it's WhatsApp or Kick or um, WeChat, whatever, TikTok, they can communicate directly without the parents ever being aware. And it's a little unfair to pick on teachers because this can happen in a lot of different ways. Right. Of course, that's where my head's at because that's the work I've been doing. Yeah. It's uh, and, and, and you make a really good point there that the, the, that 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 window is so unknown um, yes. <laughs> and disruptive, um, and you're right. There's a lot of bad bad decisions made made in that time. Um, yeah, and that's... it's look, it's hard for parents. And and I think again, the earlier you start with this, you know, with rules that are reasonable about what happens to devices at night, the better off everyone is. And you know, it's not an inconceivable idea for parents to say, well, I'm going to live by the same rules. My device will go to bed at 10 p.m. Right. or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, and, and just set a good example, you yeah. know, that from 10 to 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., you know, these devices need need their rest. <laughs> And so, <laughs> Put them to bed before you go to bed. Right, and I'll 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 give you I'll give you a little insight into the author's life. I I will never stop kicking myself for not being the person to write "Good Night Cell Phone" because somebody beat me. Ah, <laughs> oh, that is a title right there, isn't it? Well, of course, there's there's a book in the United States. I don't know how popular it is in the UK called "Good Night Moon," and we read it to all of our children yeah. endlessly because they got loved it for it. hours. Yeah, it's lovely. Right, and and so yeah, that that was one big fat missed opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, as we're coming up to time, thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak with us. It's been 
Absolutely amazing. So for our listeners, we'll put some links on uh, on um, where we post this out, linked in various platforms. Just so that where can people find you? Where can people pick up a copy of the book? I got this from Amazon. Yeah, that that's uh, the easiest place to get that book and all of my other books, except for The Naked Employee, which is the only one out of print so far. Um, but people can also visit my website, frederiklane.com or cybertraps.com. Awesome. Frederick, thank you so much for taking the time. Definitely the next Cyber Trap um, book. I look forward to hearing more when that's due. We would love to have you back on. And um, yeah, we look forward to for keeping up and catching up with you soon. That's great, Neil. Thanks so much. Thank you.